Mi español no es suficiente para tú me entiendes por todo el uh, talk, porque I will try to speak slowly enough in, Sp in English. Uh, if you have a question, you can ask in English or Spanish, and if you speak slowly enough, I can probably understand it. But I want to cover several things in this talk, which is mostly about sources and resources for higher performance computing. A lot of the work that we do is at the very lowest edge of mathematics in, in the third grade. Um, just to give you a, a, a bit of what we sometimes call the proof by Google. If you were to go to your friendly neighborhood, Google, and say, I want to find something that a student seven, eight, or nine years old could use to test how well they're learning the arithmetic they're expected to learn, then of the millions of resources out there, the number one resource that comes back is from this very small nonprofit organization that I started in North Carolina about 18 years ago. And you would get materials of all kinds from grade three on up. This computer or the one behind it, is capable of doing a billion calculations a second, 10 to the ninth. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is a million times faster. So these are doing gigaflops. A thousand times giga is Terra. And there was for several years an organization in the US called TerraGrid which connected all the teraflop quality computers together. And the NSF, when the speeds were another thousand times faster. Does anybody know what that's called? It's called petascale. And what I'm simply asserting is that if you go to the internet and say, I'd like to learn something about petascale computing, and this little nonprofit that I helped start in North Carolina is where the stuff is. It's where the content, the tutorials, the curriculum, and in some cases, paid internships. Right. Now, right now, we don't have permission to use our funding for other than US nationals. But as part of the discussion with EFIT and Medellin and other schools in your city, it may very well be possible that we could go to the Office of International Science and Engineering and find the funding for that if there's an interest. If nobody wants to do it, it's not our job to talk you into it. But if you're interested and you're capable and you want to be part of this million times faster world, then there's some things that we can do there. We'll talk a little bit about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Most of it has to do with a new organization that they're calling Exceed. And part of that is in the nature of politics. And the word politics in the US comes from two parts. Poly, that means many, and ticks, which are blood-sucking parasites. Do you, do you know what a tick is? Okay. So the problem with the, the scale at which things are growing is they had the TerraGrid, which was 10 to the 12th level computers. And people were afraid that if they created a petagrid, that by the time they really came up to speed, they would already be an exa. So the name of the program already has the letter X in it, because the assumption is by the time we're already in the second of a five-year program, by the time the fifth year comes around, we should be another factor of 1,000 faster in computing. But this idea of exceed and the resources there are to bring resources that are currently primarily funded through the United States National Science Foundation. But at the same time, the phrase people around the world use these resources is one of the reasons I'm talking today is to make sure that you know what those resources are all about. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about exceed. You're going to see the words 
exceed user portals several times. We're going to talk a little bit about how to get started and the ways that people can work together. But I also want to make sure that we're all on a more even playing field. So let's talk a little bit about what makes these computers so incredibly different. And so I want to have this also as, a, as an introduction to the concept of parallel thinking. Right? So we'll, we'll do a little bit of parallel thinking at the same time that we're going to be talking about these. And we'll go through some other resources. So the idea of pulling together any given computer model, any scientific model, any mathematical model, you're combining computation with experiment and the theory together. Right? And ultimately, the process of building understanding is one that is sequential and mediated and has lots of intermediate steps. And ultimately, we have what's called the universal theory of everything. I'm going to show you a model that is absolutely exact and fits all areas of science. We, we submitted this to Stockholm. We never got an answer back. Okay, so here it is. The right answer is the wrong answer plus corrections. And a lot of what you do in science is you learn to deal with the wrong answer because you have no idea what the corrections are. You've got to get really knowledgeable about the wrong answer so that you'll understand why it isn't the right answer. Right? You, you have to do a lot of measurements and observations to realize that something you're doing just doesn't really explain the world as much as you thought it would. And so you have to have a bigger picture of things. But often, we do things wrong because we can't otherwise make any progress because we don't know how to do it right. I'll give you an example. For many, many years, astrophysicists have modeled galaxies as follows. You label the stars 1 through n. And for i less than j, two at a time, you add up all the forces on any given star. I'm here to tell you galaxies do not label their stars 1 through n. And then line up and sequentially, i less than j, figure out where does every star move in the next time step of the universe. All of the stars in a galaxy interact with all of the other stars at the same time, all the time. They operate in parallel. And there are theories that say, if I have a massively parallel computer, shouldn't I be able to simulate massively parallel worlds in a more direct way, rather than simplifying it to the point where you, you basically have to force an artificial structure on the math because at least we can do that. Right. Now parallelism is opening up the need to rethink the math that we have been doing and so part of this is to come up with better wrong answers that get closer to the right answer. Right. By the way, if you do, does anyone do asymptotic theory? Asymptotic theory is great. Look at what happens. If I take the right answer and I factor out the wrong answer, then I get one plus the corrections over the wrong answer. And if the corrections are small compared to the wrong answer, then the wrong answer is the right answer. Okay, so, but here's the problem. Again, I, I said it slowly and in English. We often have no idea what the corrections are. So when we ignore this, many times we're making what is called an uncontrolled approximation. We hope it's not going to mess up the entire theory. But until we can actually get inside this and start making better approximations. And normally, the four biggest obstacles are we don't have enough memory, we don't have enough speed, we don't have enough bandwidth, and we don't have enough good ideas. All right, which one do you think is the biggest inhibitor? Okay. But, but they all can be. But at some point, we're going to have to start looking at where these things are going. Okay, so talking a little bit past some of these ideas. Part of what we're trying to do, by the way, I often use this in an inner class because it turns out it's easy to show that Albert Einstein never said this. Even though if you Google it, everybody says on Google that Albert Einstein said this. Right? In fact, 
somebody in the 1970s said it in the back of some flippant book on computer science, and and then later, and he he said Albert Einstein said it, and he said the reason he did it is that people pay a lot more attention if you say Albert Einstein said it, than if he said I said it, right? And so he would he would often make up these quotes and then say, oh, the, as Robert Oppenheimer once said, you know, and he'd write down as Albert Einstein once said. Okay. Anyway, the fact is is that even if Albert Einstein didn't say it, it's still true. What the human has to do is get the problem right at least once at the beginning and let the computer do the repetitious, tedious part of the work over and over and over and over to try to get this thing done. And sometimes we can take advantage of things that are in parallel independent and sometimes we can take advantage of what are called special architectures to speed up calculations. They're not the way you might normally do it, but if you have a computer chip that does something a particular way, sometimes the artificial thinking lets you take advantage of that in ways that you might not otherwise have realized. Let me give you an example. This is from part of my work called, Can We Use Mathematics to Make a Better Boy Scout? Okay. So in the Boy Scouts, a lot of times what you're trying to do are various types of knots and interactions. And one of the things that you're expected to be able to do is to very quickly take a piece of rope and turn it into a rope ladder so you can lower it down to somebody and they have things to hold on to while they're climbing up either out of the water or off the side of a cliff or they're falling down somewhere. And so you make this and you have lots and lots of these things and you lower it down and then you give something for somebody to climb up. If they're, right? And the idea is how do you make that and how do you make that very fast and one of the ways that people have learned to do this is they practice, right? They do it very, very fast. The problem is practice is only going to get you so far. If you apply what we know about mathematical modeling, let me model for you what I've just done. If I take a number line and I take A over B, so that's the number A, that's the number B, and that's A over B, and I'm going to store the result, okay? So I have A over B. And I want to add to that A over C plus A over D plus A over E. And I might want to do that often. So you take another knot, A over B. Do you notice how much somebody who's practiced this can do it a lot better? But look at my mathematical model. What is the same in every one of those terms? So what can I do to simplify this expression? In English, it starts with an F, and it rhymes with actor it out. <laughs> so I could have A times the quantity, 1 over B plus 1 over C plus 1 over D plus 1 over E. Now, for those of you that have done some kind of computer science, let me describe the algorithm that you would have to program at some level. Even though you may not write it, it's what the computer is really doing. Fetch A. Fetch B, do the division, store the result. Fetch A, fetch C, do the division, recall the intermediate result, add the intermediate, store the intermediate. Fetch A, fetch D, do the division, okay? How many times do I fetch A here? Once, okay, so in some ways you can think it's faster. For those of you that know the history of Cray, one of the things that Seymour Cray was able to do to make the Cray computer so much faster is he got rid of division and he replaced it with inverse multiplying. And it turns out inverse multiplying is a lot faster than dividing. It's not as accurate. It's not as precise. You lose about one bit out of 64 bits of accuracy. But it might be worth it to make it faster. I don't know if you've ever seen the choice that you make when you build a computer center, but you're given three choices. Cheap, fast, and good and you get to pick one of those. Right? So if you want to pick a fast computer, it may not be very cheap, and it might not be as good as if you were willing to go slower. If you want a very good computer, it may not be very fast, and it may not be cheap. And I guarantee if you buy a cheap computer, it's not fast, and it's not good. Okay. All right. So does everybody have an image in their mind of what happened here? Now let's do the next one. If I take B and I invert it, I just, right? 
So 1 over b plus 1 over c plus 1 over d plus 1 over e, if I multiply them all by a, what do you get? Do you see that it's faster? But, but you have to rethink the problem. You say, no, no, you first have to do this one, then you do the next knot, then you do the next knot, then you do the next knot. You say, no, no, that's not true. You rethink the problem. The math tells you there's faster ways to do it. And in the physical reality implementing the mathematical model, you could link together partial solutions. So I get part of the answer very fast over and over and over, and then I get the rest of the answer as something that just pops through. All right. And there's a lot of what goes on with this when you're thinking about parallelism and vector GPU type calculations. If you rethink the problem, you might be able to take advantage of it. But you often have to study, think, and ask the question, do I have to do it the way people have been doing it for 30 years? Or if I rethink it, can I find ways to introduce parts of it that are effectively parallel, independent, or could be done as a running vector? Right. I mean, those are parts of things that come on. So that if you've ever had to tie a sheep shank in truly parallel fashion, right, there's a single instruction multiple data sheep shank in which two loops, two over loops, two tugs, two pulls are distributed between two hands and all of it's done in parallel, which is not the way they teach you how to do it in the Boy Scouts. Right? Right. But you can use math to make a better Boy Scout, and we can use it to make a better biology model, chemistry model, engineering model, whatever, but you're going to have, it's not simply saying, I have this computer code and I want to get it to run in parallel. If you really want to get it to run in parallel, what you're probably going to want to do is to invest the time to rethink the science and ask the question, where is the parallelism that's in the nature of what I'm modeling that will let me take advantage of the nature of parallelism? And I'll tell you something that's a rude awakening for many people is, for as many different parallel computers that are at as many different centers right now, you will have as many different implementations of that solution. There's not really that much close overlap in performance that it's really a matter of details and tuning for these systems, right? And that makes it hard. But it's also very rewarding when you get stuff to really work along. Let me give you a sense of why the missing piece is missing. The green curve is what you get when you take a certain amount of work and you divide it over certain numbers of processors. If I have a certain amount of work and I increase the number of processors, in theory, it ought to be faster. But not necessarily for all problems. Okay? I'll give you an example. Suppose it takes three years to grow a tree tall enough that once you cut it for limber, you can get a single board that's seven meters long. How long would it take to give a seven meter board if you plant 10 trees? Still takes three years, but you get more boards. But you don't necessarily speed it up by making more things work on it. All right? And there's other reasons for that, but not the least of which is that not everything can be broken up in either what's called functional decomposition or domain decomposition to break up a problem into various parts. Some things can. I don't know if you went to Catholic school, but I did, and the nuns always had us grade our own papers by exchanging our papers, and then they would read out number one and the answer, and you would mark the paper on your desk. So would the person next to you, so would the person next to you, right? So all of the papers in class are being graded in parallel. But there's other things like essay questions that you can't necessarily break up that way, and it just takes a long time to do it. But, but this is a piece of what we're trying to do. And this work divided by the number of processors, in theory, goes down. Unfortunately, this red line is what most theoretical computing centers forget, and that is for every processor that has to get work done, I've got to tell it what to do. Right? 
And so there is some amount of time that is proportional to the number of processors. And, and it could be worse than this, but in the best case, it's linear. And the sum of those two numbers is the total time to science, which you see has a minimum at what turns out to be, for almost all cases, a very small number of processors. And so if you think you have a thousand processors and your job's gonna run a thousand times faster, you're probably kidding yourselves. It's possible that if you use 20 or 30 or 100 of those processors, you can get some speed up, after which it will actually start slowing down. So what you have to think about is, okay, in that case, let me use 100 processors on one project, one problem, one job, and I'll use the next 100 processors either on someone else's job or on another copy of this one to do a different set of parameters. But you're not going to get the 1,000 times speed up just because you increase the number of processors. Now part of this, because of that communication, I learned from my mother when I was a young child. I walked into the kitchen and there was, my mother was cooking Thanksgiving dinner. There's all sorts of things to be done. And I said, mom, is there anything I can do to help? Imagine having two processors instead of one, right? In theory, shouldn't it be better? And my mother said, Robbie, it would take me longer for me to explain to you what I need to have done than for me to do it myself. Have you ever heard something like that? I mean, but this idea that if you have a, a, a dual core or quad core processor, which you probably have, and you actually write code to use more than one core on your own computer, the two core version of that code is much slower than the one core version of the code. Because one of those cores is not only doing the work, it's telling the other one what to do. Right? So it's getting less work done faster. Right. So part of this is trying to figure out where is the sweet spot for any given architecture, algorithm, and application. And that's why if you're going to use Exceed resources, one of the things you're going to need to appreciate is what are some of the details for how many cores, how many processors, how much of the memory is local and how much is distributed, what is the programming algorithm given the network, is it a loosely coupled network or is it a tightly coupled network on a back plane? You know, how does it really work? Because if you have, and watch this curve, if you have a situation where you can reduce the data load then you can greatly increase the sweet spot. And you'll notice that in this case, I've written the word smaller, meaning it takes less time and less time and less time. Now, you're all the way down to 165 processors before it starts getting slower again, where before we were more like 20. All right. Another thing that you can do is you can increase the amount of work that you have to be done and therefore the overhead compared to, you know, the how much work do you do once you find out that you're going to do it can be reduced. But it's, again, it's one of those cases where if you, if you think, oh, I have this code I've been running for the last five years in biology, and now I'm going to simply port it. I'm going to just get it to run on a parallel system. It's not going to be very satisfying. Okay? You're going to have to change your expectations to, to have something like that work and, and, and work effectively. So a lot of what people are doing is putting a lot of this information out on the internet and there hasn't been very much filtering up until a couple of years ago, right? So every supercomputing center would have a tutorial on MPI and open MPI, but not all of them were as good as the others. So one of the things that we decided with funding from the National Science Foundation was that we needed to build a high quality way to review the materials that were being used to teach parallel and high performance computing. Right? And so there's a collected set of reviewed materials and the materials go through what's called VVA. All right? Verification validation and accreditation. 
Verification means, did you solve the problem right? Does this tutorial do what it says it does? Validation is, did you solve the right problem? Right? Because not every tutorial is appropriate for every architecture. So you got to make sure you get the right one. And accreditation is, it's a lot like schools that get accredited. Does it do what it says it does? Is it appropriate for the grade level it's... So you say, this is for introductory users. And then you go in and you find out that the person who wrote the tutorial, all over the tutorial, every single page is completely filled with UTAs. Do you know what UTAs are? They're undefined three-letter acronyms. Okay? So if you, if you have a tutorial that has all of this jargon, all of this stuff in it that you have to be an expert to kind of know what it means, or you don't include a glossary or something. I mean, it's not, even though it all might be technically true, it's kind of like that line from Absence of Malice. It's, it, it's, it's correct, but it's not true. It, it doesn't give you the full picture of what's happening. So we go through this, and there's a tremendous amount of material that we've been building on to try to get this out there. So this is one of the sources of resources that's out there. And this is a sub-project of Exceed now. It was started under TerraGrid, and it's been continued under Exceed. And a lot of the work to build this material, do the accreditation, test the tutorials, um, is actually done by college kids and high school kids who work in North Carolina. Right? So we have a group of interns who do this work, and they're really good at quality assurance. Right? And if you say something works, they're going to test it. Right? So that's one of the sources and resources for the things that are out there. Right. Um, so where do you get a lot of this stuff? I mean, I showed you before you could go to Petascale Education. But that assumes that the stuff that's out there has some reason to be believed. Right? So suppose you come in one day and you find out that you know, it's gone, right? Or, or it's the structure, it's just fallen under its own weight. You know, what do you do then, right? And then that's why we have these, call it Web 3.0, in, in totally personalized terms. Web 2.0 is sometimes called the democratization of the web. Anybody could put anything out there if they wanted to. That doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that it's any good. And so some of these projects, like the Exceed Portal, HB, HPC University, are, are highly edited. Not everything gets in there. Right? If it doesn't pass review, it doesn't get in there. Right? And so we get rid of all of the politics of which computing center came up with which tutorial, and we only provide access to the stuff that's proven to be useful in a teaching or learning setting. So let's think about thinking, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit why it's hard from the standpoint of thinking parallel and rethinking very simple problems, or what you think is a simple problem. And as soon as you get into a parallel universe, you really need to know about the details. And that's one of the things, again, Exceed has many, many sources and resources, and I'll show you the variety. But whether it has you know, a massive number of independent cores, does each core have its own GPU? Does each you know, functional unit have its own local cache memory? Is all the memory distributed? Is some of the memory distributed? I mean, all of that is gonna go into deciding which resource looks like your science. So if you're doing chemistry or biology or physics, a different machine might actually be a better choice and so working with, and you all have a center here on campus to do some of that working with, right? and you have your own machine that's, okay, right. But again, even at that stage, 500 cores, do they have GPUs, do they have this, do they have that? You'd want to know a little bit more before you just say, oh, I'm going to throw this on and it'll run 500 times faster. Right? So instead of taking two years, you can get the job done in one day, maybe. All right, so I'm going to give you a really simple math problem, and I'll bet, even though it might have been in a different language, 
you've seen this problem before. Okay, so I don't want you to shout out the answer until I ask for it. Right? But I want you to think about how would you calculate a very, very simple word problem. Right? You probably didn't expect it. Five o'clock in the afternoon, you'd be getting word problems. Okay, so here's the rate problem. If one painter can paint one house in one day, how many houses can seven painters paint in a week? Don't say the answer until I ask for it. So think about it. one painter gets one house painted in one day. How many houses would seven painters paint in a week? All right, on the count of three, your loudest answer. One, two, three. Do you work seven days a week? What do you mean by week? What if the houses were anywhere between 500 yards and 500 miles apart? What if you only had one paintbrush? You got seven painters, but you only have one paintbrush. What if you got seven paintbrushes, but the store that sells you the paint that you have to use is only open on Tuesdays and will only sell you two gallons per week? So one painter painting one house in one day doesn't scale if you think about resource allocation, network latency, synchronization and variable path to memory, right? If I'm here and the memory's here, it doesn't take very long for me to store it here. If I'm here and the memory's up in that corner of the room, and some of these computers are bigger than this room, it's going to take longer to get this memory there and then to get it back. It doesn't have to be very big data to be big data if the data is far away. Because what's really big is how long does it take you to get the data, process it, and learn something from it. It may not be massive amounts of data. It might be very important data that's very far away. Right. So again, this is, this is the thinking part of parallel thinking that if we're going to take advantage, and we have to. Again, your computer is being delivered, your little laptop is being delivered with a multi-core, either two, four, or eight cores in it, most of which are slower than the one core computer you had a couple years ago. For most business applications, Excel is now running 20 to 50 times slower than it did two years ago. On a computer that they tell you is faster because it has all these parallel cores. But they're not working together on the same problem at the same time. You may have the illusion of parallelism because one of your cores is running your iTunes, one of your cores is running your Messenger, one of your cores is running your web browser, one of your cores is running something else. And therefore, it will appear to be faster because there's no resource contention. But what if you're actually trying to do work? <laughs> you're computing because you're a physicist, chemist, engineer. You know, you're trying to render an image because you're an artist. And, and you need those processors process. Right? That's, that's where the human has to come in and say, we've got to rethink how this is being done. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck with whatever software is provided for us by somebody else right? who may not have high performance computing as the answer. All right, so let me think about different ways you can think about introducing parallelism into a problem, All right? This is a very rough units argument. If you were a physicist, you would say, no, 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 it's power that's equal to work over time. It's the same thing. If you're productive, you will be powerful. Okay? So I can get a certain amount of work done in a certain amount of time. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale up the resources by introducing S processors. So the scaling factor is S, right? And so if I multiply both sides by S, how, are, how differently could I think about where to put that number of processors to work so I actually get an improvement in some way? And normally, you're picking between these paths to improvement. So the first way is if I multiply this side by S, this is bigger, 
And I could accomplish that by taking the time and dividing it by s. See how I multiplied s on both sides? Because if you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the inverse. So this is identical to that. But what I call this is sooner. The work you're doing is the same, but you get it done in less time. And for many people, that's the only definition of improvement. They want their answers sooner. And, and maybe that's good for some things. You want to figure out where the storm is going to be faster so you can make an earlier warning to people. On the other hand, I could come over and take that S and multiply it by the entire problem. So I can get one job done in this amount of time, but I could get lots of jobs done in that time, like the problem of growing the, the trees. So I'm not just solving one parameter optimization for a small molecule, which will not take advantage of lots of processors, but I could use lots of copies. So I could actually do a parameter sweep. And it doesn't take a very complicated theory to require many calculations in parallel that don't have anything to do with each other. But if you did them all at the same time when you're done, you could then ask the question, which one gave me the biggest value, the smallest value, the best value? Right? So think of a simple mathematical expression that might be a product of an exponential times a cosine times something else. And it has 10 parameters. And you're going to do the most crude brute force. And for each of the 10 parameters, you're going to have 10 values. That's a very coarse kind of calculation. How many times do I have to do that calculation to get a comparison between all of them? 10 to the 10th. 10 billion runs of that job. Now, if I could do thousands of them at the same time, you know, I could, I, it's still going to take me millions of timestamps to get the thing done. But you're not going to get it done by trying to use many processors on a small problem. It's not a big problem. It's just a simple algebraic expression that has 10 parameters. That's not hard. But I need to do it 10 billion times. That's what makes it hard. So I could do more copies of the same job or different jobs. Right? Can anybody guess where the next place I can stick the S is? No guesses? I can simply multiply the numerator. And I can do more work in the same amount of time. In other words, I could have a theory that's more complicated. I can do a higher order integration. I can do something that takes an advantage not just nearest neighbors, but second nearest neighbors as well. So I can, I can have a more detailed, perhaps more accurate, perhaps improved theory where I'm not ignoring things because they took too long to calculate. If I have a faster computer, maybe. I can do, so instead of doing a simulation that we were limited to not that long ago to a few thousand stars in a galaxy, now that we have a supercomputer that not just has more processors, it has more memory. And for that reason, we can now do hundreds of thousands of stars in the galaxy simulation. We're starting to learn new things from the simulations that we did not know only a couple of weeks ago because those simulations are better simulations. It still takes, you know, three weeks to three months to run it. But now instead of doing a very, very simplified version, we're doing something that's much more elaborate. And that's where, again, depending upon the kind of science you want to do, you're going to have to think about, do I try to get my science done sooner? Do I try to get more science done or do I try to get better science done? Right? Sooner, more, better. I looked it up. It's antes, mas, mejor. Right? You know, and that's the, that's the philosophy that you're looking at. When you say I'm doing it a, as an improvement, do you measure it by time? Do you measure it by amount of productivity? Or do you measure it by quality of solution? Right? And normally, you're not trying to get all three at the same time because that's beyond what. I mean, we'd be perfect. That's the ideal world. But you know, often, we can't 
deal in the ideal world. There they are. See, if you take them off and put them down, and then you need them. All right. So this idea of the kinds of things that you're going to need to think about are whether you've got a vector GPU and array processor engaged in the process and how many of them are there and are they, are they balanced, right? Um, you may have heard of homogeneous versus heterogeneous computing, right? And the big thing between the two is synchronization. How important is it that everything be done at the same time in the same way or could you be splitting things off and ultimately it's computational management, right? Where you're even going through and doing things in very different ways. And this is a, a big part of, of what we're talking about. So let's talk about, for a few minutes anyway, some of the exceed resources that you can use. Most of this presentation was put together by Steve Gordon and Scott Lathrop. And I'll make sure there's a copy of it that hangs around because it's got some URLs in it that you might want. I'm not going to read you every slide. As I told some people earlier today, the actual code name for what we do at the Shodor Foundation is called Beyond Power Pointlessness. Okay. Because we normally find PowerPoint. The, do you, are you familiar with the software company SAS? Statistical software. It's actually headquartered in North Carolina. It was started by an agriculture statistics professor who wrote some Fortran subroutines, put them on the university's mainframe, and his computer director said, get those off here. They're, they're wasting too much space. So, so he says, yeah, but I developed them on university time. The univers eh, university doesn't want any. Just get them off, and that became SAS. So he gave a tremendous talk on entrepreneurship at North Carolina State University. No PowerPoint, he just talked, used a little marker board for examples and things. And somebody asked him, why, why no PowerPoint? And he said, in my company, people that are relying on PowerPoint usually have very little power and absolutely no point. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this, where it's coming from. So the idea is people are as important as the machines. So what Exceed spends most of its time doing, believe it or not, is connecting people. And it's the scientists using the machines that generate the new knowledge. Right? That's a big part of this. But the machines have to be there and they have to be running and they have to be accessible and, and they have to be able to be used. One of the things that a lot of people have not thought about is that they think computing is the problem. It's more often than not that data storage is the problem. That when you compute something, do you save it or throw it away and then you have to compute it again? And if you do save it, where are you gonna put it? Right? Because if it's a really big calculation that needs one of these kind of computers, you're, you're generating a lot, of, a lot of numbers. I'll let you do the exercise, but try the following. Suppose you wanna calculate the properties of a drop of water at the molecular level. So you want to have a molecule to molecule interaction. If you wanted to start that simulation, you would need to assign to every molecule in a drop of water an initial position in X, Y, and Z, an initial velocity in X, Y, and Z, and an initial acceleration in X, Y, and Z. Right? And then what you're going to do after you get the calculation started is then have the molecules interact in some way. Now this isn't to talk about units conversion, but it's not hard to show that if you do you know, molecules per mole, moles per drop, drops per cc, you know, and you go all the way through, that you, on the fastest supercomputer available to any university professor in the United States, you could actually assign the initial value to every particle in just under five years. However, the amount of memory it would take to store all those numbers is more memory that's been made up till now in the history of mankind. So even if you could do it, it would take you five years on the world's fastest supercomputer. 
But having done that, where, where are you going to put those numbers? Right? There, you know, you just, there's not enough silicon memory storage of any kind to do that. So that's going to be a big part. And this user productivity, I don't know if you noticed my little name of that Excel spreadsheet was TTS, time to science. Right? That's what we really want to increase the productivity. We want to decrease how long it takes you to have a really cool idea and get something done, especially if you have to compute it. Right? That's productivity for doing that. So understanding that the science that we're trying to do is important. And again, in this case, it's, we really do have to come back. This science is actually a placeholder for human knowledge. It is not only physics, biology, and chemistry. All right? If you're learning something about the connectedness of words in a manuscript, and you're doing linguistic analysis on massive data sets, that is science. You are learning something about the world. It is knowledge. All right? If you're analyzing Calder's work and you're looking at the fractal dimensions of different artists, that's, that's art analysis. But it's human knowledge. Okay, So don't even though it's the National Science Foundation and they use the word science, I, trust me, they're not that narrow vision that they're only thinking about chemistry, biology, physics, and occasionally engineering. So the engineers get in there too. But See, they say, well, how come you don't say engineering? Well, it's part of science in this way of thinking. All right. All right. So... I'm just, I'm just going to, the, the only important part is the part at the top. There's a difference between resources and services, right? And both of them are available through Exceed. So sometimes access to the machine is the resource you need, okay? Sometimes having somebody explain to you a better way to visualize the data is a service that you need. Right? And sometimes it, it, it could go other ways. So services and resources are, are both included here, and it's not always clear which is which. You'll see why I'm flipping through this. Okay, you've seen this. All right, so sources. Remember when I said a few minutes ago that often the biggest breakthrough in this large-scale computing is memory, not processing? Right. That's often the case. Is if you have a problem that's big enough that you can compute it, right? it's nice to be able to compute it quickly. But the biggest part is, can you even fit the problem on, on your system, right? Or do you have to invent ways of strip mining or slicing or slabbing the problem so you can do parts of it at a time? So that's a big part of where we're going is, is the distributed memory systems is an important, it's the memory part and getting to and from is an important piece, right? Um, the shared memory and the throughput. So for instance, the o OSG, there's a UTA, Open Science Grid. These are a huge set of resources in different science areas where anybody can walk up and say, I would like to do science, but you know, I, I don't have the resource on my own system. So you could come up and say gridchem.org, and I don't know if this is territorial, I don't think it is, but if you came up to gridchem.org, any Person, come on. I don't know. This, this, it could be that everybody's trying to get work done on a Monday evening back in the U.S. Let me try. Nope, that's there. So this is the National Science Digital Library from the U.S. NSDL.org. And I'm just assuming that we have a slow machine in Kentucky. All right. So one of, one of the things about nope. Yes, I did. OK. So if you try enough different things, eventually it's going to come back anyway. Um, you may have heard the fundamental law of presentations. And it's, if it dies, it's biology. If it smells, it's chemistry. 
and if it doesn't work, it's physics. Okay. Okay. So what is what is an example of an open science grid? For many, many, many chemists, are there any chemists here? None. Okay. So of course I picked the one example that none of you care about. Okay. But that's good. You all equally don't care about it. But any chemist, just about anywhere, can be using this. That doesn't mean they are. But can you see all along this band you have users? Do you see any users down here? No. But any chemist who wanted to could go to the open science grid for chemistry and basically get access to a Gaussian quality calculation for any molecule or protein that they want. And they don't have to use up computer cycles on your own campus. You don't have to license the software. All of that's been done for you. Right? And there are simple, similar things that are available for remote computation of a variety of resources. And that open science grid is, is one of the places where this kind of comes in. A big part of this is visualization engines. Okay. A lot of times you have all this data, but you need to look at it. And you were able to generate it, but you don't have the resources to do the complex multidimensional visualizations. And you might not have the software. Exceed has a lot of that, and that, a lot of that is available. So keep in mind that a lot of these things are distributed, and it does take an organized mind to kind of go through them. Uh, examples, and I'll just leave this as names of machines that you might have, is lots of different systems. In fact, your system came as a piece of what had been at Purdue when they upgraded to do something else. Is that right? Right. But there's a bunch of these computers that are out there, and they're looking at everything from a loose cluster of processors to very tightly controlled petaflop Cray uh, systems or Again, a distributed cluster versus a tight cluster, a tight cluster, a, a distributed cluster, and a half distributed, half tight cluster. So a lot of it has to do with what are the chips that are connecting things. Right. And, and I'll, again, I'll leave this with, with you all to sort of make available if you need the actual contact information of things. User services. Let's start from the bottom. Getting people to want to be scientists. They call that user engagement. You know, how do we get middle school, high school, college, graduate students to want to do work, which is basically very hard, right? It's not going to be necessarily all fun and games. Part of that is once you identify people who want to be good at it, is providing the training to help them become good at it, right? And then once they have training, then you've got to get them access to the allocation process to use the system, right? So. You say, well, I want to get on that system. One of the things that we've realized is if we train you before you get on the system, you will use the system better than if we just let you on the system and then you realize, oh my gosh, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. So user engagement, then training, then allocations. And then, of course, within all of that, it's a cycle. There's web-based and technical information that's, that's all available. Okay, I've got just a little bit more that I think and then there will be questions. So if you remember from the beginning or near the beginning, I said this user site is really one of the places that if you get nothing out of it and you remember that URL, you will have access to the resources that I've been talking about because it's all kind of webbed together. There are how to get the resources, how to get started, how to get things on there, what to do. You basically have to identify yourself once to get into the system and so that we can, again, typically verify that you are who you say you are. And then all the things that you can do from that, that portal uh, to get those uh, particular interesting things. It's either the next or the next. Oh, you, you don't need to know as much about that. Getting started. Outreach services, um, student engagement, there, and again, this is where we're going to have to do some fundraising to get the international component going. A fair amount of underrepresented engagement, and some of this is being done with these international collaborations, and then figuring out a way to have what are called campus champions. 
somebody on each campus that's trained and can go through and, and do things. Um, this is the US-based stuff. Um, Gateway Discovery, in July there's a meeting in San Diego. Uh, the, the, we are trying to find ways to bring an international component. And this is the one you want to ask me more about and I'll try to get you more information and see if I can get it to work. Um, so besides the Open Science Grid User School, there's an international high performance summer school in New York City and it really is international. You can apply. There are some scholarships for travel. In Guatemala, there's going to be a workshop this summer. I, I, they did not give me the final dates on it, but they did say it's this summer, and that's how you get more information on it. Um, it's on big data and visualization, right? And it's really geared towards building this uh, Central and Latin American collaboration with people. Uh, the meeting that's going to be in San Diego, and then next November, uh, a huge amount of work that's being done at the supercomputing conference itself. And if you go to the SC website, there's a lot of stuff, especially on the, what, uh, the community program and the international ambassadors and, and things like that that could be interesting. Right? And of course, the TNTL, too numerous to list type things that are going on there. And as we've said before, the overall organization in Exceed the materials that are most accessible at any grade level, and then the next instantiation of supercomputing for the things that are out there. So I hope you've gotten some sense of what makes parallel different than simply speeding things up. Right? The thinking part has to be there, and I can tell you from having reviewed many proposals, the thinking part actually hasn't been there. A lot of people think they're just going to move their code to a faster computer and it's going to run faster. We need lots of new ideas from lots of young people. The old guys are getting tired, you know. Uh, we, we, there was one computing center that wrote a massive proposal that was funded for hundreds of millions of dollars. And five years after the proposal, the only people using that computer were the people that had written the proposal five years earlier. <laughs> right? the, the, we, we need new people to get excited about high performance computing. And, but understand, it's not going to be Oh, you go in, you kick around a little bit, you watch cat videos, you know, you, you do a few things and then you go home. I mean, it's hard work, but it's, it's engaging, it's fun, it's challenging, it's very well paid. People that do this get very good jobs, right? And it's also a way to do an international uh, travel. I mean, most of supercomputing is as international as, as any area of science these days. So that's what I hope to have told you today. Uh, if there's questions, comments, or concerns, I will try to answer them. What I used to do when I taught physics is if there weren't any questions, take out a piece of paper, put your name on the top. Did you ever have teachers that did that? Yes. Well, a, a lot of it is that Exceed is itself a distributed organization. So every RP, every resource provider, has a staff, right? And then there's a, an overall allocations. There's a review to make sure that the requests are being made for the right architecture and the right software on a machine. But then, you know, it's like the, it's more than the sum of the parts. But with all of those users, you're basically simply trying to scale up. And a lot of it is um, asynchronous, where you're doing work, submitting jobs, things are coming back, emails go back and forth, right? And it's not everybody calling on the phone at the same time, right? But, but a lot of it is the fact that each of these supercomputing centers is more than just a machine, right? It's a very large staff that is there to provide services so that the resources can be well used, right? And then a lot of it is, once you're in the system, there's a lot of 
management to make sure there's not duplication and there's some security checks that have to be done. I mean, we reserve the right to not let anybody use the machine if they've, you know, there are certain countries that can't use the machines. North Korea, you know, can't use the machine. Syria can't use the machine. Now, that doesn't mean somebody from Syria can't, but they can't use it from Syria at a Syrian institution that's under control of a government that promotes terrorism. But I don't think we have that problem with Colombia. Although we had some terrified people on the airplane last night when the pilot didn't make the first landing and then he had to go around. You were on that flight? Remember that? And then when we did hit, it sounded like the tire blew? You know, that pilot doesn't get to use my computer. Well, other questions, comments, or concerns? Yes, in August. We will be there for three days of presentation and one and a half days of individual working with faculty. So there's, there's a workshop. For those of you that would be interested at the faculty level, if, if you were to go to one of these resources, um, it would take you very quickly to the National Computational Science Institute. The direct website is computationalscience.org, but it's, it's part of the Chodor nebulous. Um, and you'll see that there are workshops for the summer in biology, computational biology, computational chemistry, computational physics, intermediate parallel computing, and computational thinking. So that's the one at Jackson State. We, we, we're actually, I, I, we haven't changed the website yet, but we're pretty much out of travel money. But for the most part, if you can get to the workshop, we cover your expenses at the workshop. But we, we have run out of money to get people to the workshop. It was a small pool to begin with anyway. But those are, are good for faculty. And there's no reason why we can't work out something and in the future come here and do one or more of these workshops or something else that actually helps you all. Um, our phrase is we're pathologically codependent. We want to be wanted, but we need to be needed. So if you can describe how we can help you do what you all want to do here at EFIT or at other schools in Medellin, and we'll certainly try to do that. Remote computing. And the answer is eight. Other? So I ended up a bit confused about the difference between Shodor and Exceed and HPC. Okay, so Shodor is a nonprofit organization that is a member of Exceed. Right? We are a constituent element in which we contribute resources, mostly training and curriculum. We don't have a supercomputer, but we teach other people how to use theirs. Right. So you know, it's like what's the difference between Exceed and one of the universities that happens to have a computer that's on the network, right? So Exceed is the umbrella organization that ties us all together because we've agreed to work together, right? And I know I've said this more than once today, but the word collaboration, the middle part is the word labor, right? If you take out the labor, if you take out the work, all you have left is collation, which is stacking papers neatly, okay? It's work. Right. So Shodor is one of the people that, one of the organizations that puts that work together. Right. And it's a nonprofit. It's in Durham, North Carolina. I mean, you can Google it if you want to. Um, let's see, that's not it. Where are we? The name comes from 
the English equivalent of Bajo y Feo. So a student couldn't remember my name and talked to the secretary in the physics office and said, all I remember is that my professor is short and kind of dorky looking. And so, true story. But this is who we are. So we, we develop materials, we have a huge internship program, and we do a lot of workshops for faculty to improve teaching. That's our mission. Right? And then there are other places that are universities that have a computing center, and then there are other places in which the organization is a computing center. I mean, it's not necessarily tied to a university. It's, it's a national supercomputing laboratory of some kind. We, we do have some online courses. We have a lot of online tutorials, but they're not necessarily organized into a course. Right. Anything else? Hope it was helpful. Hope you stay dry. I got soaked coming over here from University of Medellin, but it's worth it. All right, thank you.